and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport, knocking down barriers and challenging the status quo for women and girls everywhere. A big thank you to Barclays for supporting this series of The Game Changers which features fearless women in football and reinforces their incredible support for the beautiful game. My guest this week is Jane Purden, now CEO at Women in Football. Jane also talks to me about her previous roles at Sunderland, the Premier League and UK Sport. I began by asking Jane about her life growing up. I grew up in Sunderland. I'm not a native of Sunderland. I'm actually a native of Birkenhead. Uh, but my my family moved to Sunderland when I was quite small because my father worked in shipbuilding and at the time they were both shipbuilding towns. And dad was a huge sports addict, really. He played all kinds of sports when he was younger. Before he got married, he cycled from Land's End to John O'Groats. That's how wow. he marked the end of his bachelor days. And I, I love that story. You know, there's no going off on a lad's weekend to Magaluf. <laughs> They were a different breed to that generation. They really were. Um, so he supported football, Tranmere Rovers, when he was in Birkenhead. And he started going to watch Sunderland as soon as we moved over. Um, and I never went. He took my brother and that was fine. You know, I'd never shown any interest until Sunderland won the Cup in 1973 when I was seven. And I always remember it. I always say kids of my generation in Sunderland, you can remember what your dad's ballot numbers were in the cup final tickets. And my dad was green S and that got him four tickets. So guess what? Mum and I stayed at home and dad took a colleague and his son. And again, that's fine. I really have no no beef about that because I've not shown any interest. The colleague had been unlucky in the ballot and had been to every game. So that was that. But I watched it on TV. And when, I'm sure you know, Sue, Ian Porterfield scored the only goal for Sunderland. (laughs) (laughs) And when that happened quite late on in the first half, I just felt myself, it was incredible, falling. That's the only way I can describe it, falling into a kind of pit of love for this game. And that was that. I was hooked. So there was then no football for a few months. but, But that summer I said to Dad... And honestly, Sue, this turns out to be one of the most important questions I've ever asked anyone in my life. And I was seven. I said, Dad, can I come to football too? And he said, yes. And he was delighted. He was absolutely delighted. It was never an issue. My only beef with the whole thing is that day one of my journey as a Sunderland supporter was the best. (laughs) What can you do? (laughs) Here we are in 2020, you know, getting on for goodness me, 40 years later, and uh, my my beloved Sunderland is struggling. But listen, I can't complain. Uh, Sunderland do lots of things very well. You know, look at the England team and how many incredible women they've produced. The foundation of light up there is is brilliant. And I'm sure that the men's team their day will come again. The club is just too big, too important. So we just weather it out. We, we will see glory in my time. So that's how I became a fan. I was actually never a sporty person myself. I was born without any sporting ability and talent whatsoever. And that's not false modesty. That's absolute God's honest truth. And and that's cool. You know, I was given other things. So I'm, I'm quite happy with the mix I was given. But I was on the second netball team the second hockey team and actually I was dropped from that <laughs> you know and and it wasn't really my thing I I kind of enjoyed sport I've always enjoyed physical activity but I've never been a sports nut so you know this year I'm one of the half a million people who downloaded couch to 5k during lockdown and I can run for an hour so for the first time in my life at the age of 54 I can run for an hour so but that's probably my biggest sporting achievement you know? <laughs> And I'm delighted. I'm absolutely thrilled I could do it. And I know I've taken a great step, fingers crossed, God willing, for my health and well-being. But being able to run seven kilometres in an hour, you know, it's not fast, but but that's my biggest sporting <laughs> achievement. 
That's fantastic. I love that. Love your honesty around it all as well. And um, like me, you went to university in the mid eighties, and actually, like me, you studied English as well too. Yeah. In fact, we are the same age, and we were at different universities at the same time. I've discovered. Um, but what did you plan to do for a career when you went to university? I had absolutely no idea. I read English, as you say. There's a football story to this, actually. Let me tell you the football piece to it, because in my gap year, I was lucky enough to win an English-speaking union scholarship to go and study in at a high school in Connecticut in the USA for six months. And this was 1985. I think the, the only times I'd left the country before I think we had a couple of family holidays in France because, you know, Sue, you're the same generation as me. We took our summer holidays in Eastbourne, right? Am I right? British kids and seventies <laughs> and Bridlington. Yeah, we didn't go abroad. So this was a real incredible experience for me. I'd just turned 19 and um, I went to this, it was a boarding school, mixed boarding school in Connecticut. And blow me down, they had a girls soccer team in 1985 and not only that but every school in the area did and I remember the coach said to me forgive my attempt at his accent but he said to me hey you're British you must play soccer and I had to say to him I've never kicked a ball in my life I felt really ashamed actually I, I felt ashamed for Britain I thought something's gone wrong in Britain that, that this is the case so getting on to university. So I got back, started at university and actually a friend of mine had started university the year before me. She hadn't taken a gap year and she gave me really good advice. She said, university is a brilliant opportunity to take up a new sport. Very, very good advice. I think that's as true now as it was then. So I thought, well, football's the obvious one. So I actually set up my college football team um, and all beginners, no one had played before. Obviously, we were well past the key skills learning age of kids where we'd actually be as good as we ever could be. Everybody had played hockey, so had the positional sense, which was helpful. But we all loved it and we improved over time. As I say, we were never great and I was never a great player, but but totally, totally loved it. So I played some football and I studied English and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I went because I, I loved English. I should say, this is the other kind of factor of my northeast background and growing up in the northeast because when dad took me to Roker Park every second Saturday the Royal Shakespeare Company did an annual season at the Theatre Royal in Newcastle and they brought their entire uh, list of productions in between the Stratford season and the London season they bring the whole lot up to Newcastle about eight plays and they'd be there for two or three weeks and my mum took me to watch everything and I sometimes, it's only now I look back on that decades later and I think with mum taking me to the RSC in Newcastle, dad taking me to Rogue Park in Sunderland, what an education. It was covered for you there, wasn't it? Was it was covered. Well, it's the need really. Um, but that gave me the, the passion and hence I ended up reading English at university. But but I had no real idea what I wanted to do with that. And I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. I knew I didn't want to be a lecturer or stay on doing master's, do research. So went out into the big wide world, a bit lost and adrift, actually. And you went on to study law? So eventually I, I ended up kind of temping as a paralegal at a law firm in my lost right. and adrift couple of years after uni. And I thought, I like this. I think I could do this. So I went back as a postgrad and did the law conversion course and the solicitor's exams and then qualified as a solicitor in 1994. And was that your initial goal then, was to work as a solicitor? You hadn't got any ideas of sport at the time, at that time? Not at all. Uh, you see, sports law didn't really exist, Sue. It, it really didn't. It, it wasn't a thing. Um, there were perhaps one or two people in the country who probably earned their, their livings as what we would now call sports lawyers and football lawyers, but there really weren't that many. Um, so my, my early career as a lawyer was a very conventional one in a medium-sized city of London law firm doing doing civil litigation. And uh, that was that. And then I, 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 I never thought I'd work in sport. I mean, I kept up the football interest. I, I played when I could. But of course, in the early to mid-1990s, it didn't exist at recreational level. You were starting to see girls and women's teams attached to clubs and at the elite end. But the kind of, you know, I'm a pub team player, in case I haven't made that clear. You know, that's my level. <laughs> And, and it just didn't exist. So it was really hard. Um, I kept watching 
Sunderland, you know, I'd always go when they were in London. I'd, or I'd always go if they were anywhere within an hour of London, which was always somewhere really nice, you know, like Brighton or Oxford, we'd have a lovely day out. But that was that. And, and I did a, a spell in the government legal service. And that's where I was in 2001 when I got a life changing phone call. Tell us about it. <laughs> so this was from a really good friend of mine um, who I'd worked with. So she knew me both professionally and personally and she rang me up one Sunday and she said there's a job in the Sunday Times and it's got your name on it and I I went out and bought the Sunday Times because that's what you did in 2001 right and I brought it back and you open the thing it's like the size of a bed sheet you know? <laughs> and I go through the appointment section and there it is Sunderland Football Club are looking for a club secretary possibly with a legal background someone with legal background and I often say this now to, to younger women. I say, I say, look, so I, I rang my, my good friend back once I'd read this. And what do you think I said to her? I said to her, I will never get that job. And it just goes to show, doesn't it? You know, we all have that imposter syndrome we, or that thing about women who look at something and go, well, the only bit I get is the possibly a legal background. That's the only <laughs> thing that where I suit this role. The rest of it, I just don't have. But my friend was brilliant and she absolutely nagged me. She said, you've got to apply, just apply, just apply, just apply. And so I did. And the rest is history. I was appointed and joined the club in July 2001. And again, this is something else I say to, to young women and men in the game, you know, to young people. Sometimes you need that person who, who knows you really well, who's got your back, who's on your side, has seen you at work as well as at play, because sometimes they can audit your skills better than you can and yeah. point you in the right direction better better than you can. So to my astonishment, and, and, and part of me is still astonished, Sue, part of me still thinks I'm going to get the call any minute, go <laughs> you know, to recruitment consultants from Sunderland 20 years ago. Oh, Jane, it was a terrible mistake. Uh, you know, I've got the job. Again, I, I, I've learned over the years, don't underplay yourself. Don't go, oh, I was lucky or, oh, why me? Recognise your strengths and abilities. But subject to that, I think I still was lucky because there was no such thing really as sports law. These days, that role would go to somebody who probably had a sports law master's, who'd maybe worked in the sports law team of a private practice firm for a few years. That's the profile of candidate who'd get it now. But at the time... Sunderland were in the Premier League at the time. You know, the Premier League was 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 wealthy, but not as stratospherically wealthy as it became. And clubs were just beginning to kind of tool up and, and upscale their staff to manage that level of resource coming in. And a club like Sunderland had probably just gone over the, the sort of size of turnover and business where it made sense to have an in-house lawyer for the first time. So it wasn't I was in the right place at the right time. It was that my friend was, and, and thank God for it. <laughs> and what was your day-to-day -day role there? What, what were you involved with? Yes, yeah, so it was the classic club secretary role. Um, so and a big part of the club secretary role, the classic club, se club secretary role, had always focused on the players' contracts and transfer agreements and on what we'd now call compliance, making sure all the rules of the league and the FA were, were complied with. And that was at the heart of it. So you can see that it made sense as these player contracts and transfer agreements began to be more valuable to get lawyers in. And of course, now, you know, clubs have, Premier League clubs have teams of lawyers to draft these things for them. There were other things as well. It was quite literally booking the team bus, quite literally, although my, <laughs> my assistant used to do that, but that, that sat in the team. It was quite literally filling out the entry form for the FA Cup, literally. <laughs> it's one thing that used to keep me awake at night, like, don't miss the FA Cup application form deadline. <laughs> um, so all kinds of pieces of, of football admin. Yeah, that's kind of the, the heart of it, really. And you were obviously welcomed as a woman at the club at that time. So were there other women at that level, uh, other yes. clubs across the prim Yeah. Well, let okay. me talk about Sunderland because I think Bob Murray, the then chairman and owner, Sir Bob Murray, as he is now, deserves a, a massive amount of credit. He said to me in my interview, he said, I like having women at the club. I like having them on my board. I like having them in my leadership team because they bring something different to it. And it was the most affirming statement about gender diversity in the workforce that anyone had ever said to me and anyone 
was to say to me for another 15 years. He's a bit ahead of his time, yeah. Incredible. And he was a, a self-made County Durham guy, you know, left school at, at, I think, 15, went to night school, qualified as an accountant, and eventually ran his own businesses extremely successfully, very, very successful, wealthy man. So, so he knows a thing or two. And he knows a thing or two about how to put together a successful business. And while I, I never asked him this, I, I suspect he'd figured this out along the way, that having diverse teams made his businesses better. And when I pitched up at Sunderland, you know, Leslie Callahan was the director of communications. Leslie Spooler was made the CEO of the Foundation of Light, which she still is. There were women throughout management and in leadership positions. And as you mentioned then, I guess that success that Sunderland had in terms of women coming through. And I've interviewed actually Steph Horton and Jill Scott for the podcast. So do you think that was part of a, the a same mindset, really, or that great place for female players at that time in terms of Sunderland? I think there's something about strong women in the North East. And I think about this a lot, soon. I don't know what it is. I, I kind of laugh with my colleagues and, and sometimes they say, there's so many of you from Sunderland. I say, no, it's in the water. <laughs> they put it in the water <laughs> up there, the water that flows from the Kielder Reservoir. But I honestly don't know what it is. I think, I think I'll think i give you a few stabs, but I, I might be well wide of the mark. I think if you look back to the days of the old industries, you know, coal mining and shipbuilding, coal mining in particular, the women had to be strong. They really did. And... It was no mean feat to raise a family and look after a family if you're a coal miner's wife. I once read a story of a woman who she had three generations of men folk in her house going down the pit, her husband, her son and her grandson. And they were all on different shifts. So they'd come off shift and they'd all need to be fed. She quite literally never went to bed. She had a, a chair in front of the fire where she kind of snatched two hours till the next one came off the shift. Wow. So I think there's something about that. When I was younger, one of the most kind of powerful political events that happened in my time was the miners' strike. I don't want to get into the politics of it, but one of the things that was so striking again, I saw with my own eyes, was how strong the women were. So I don't know, maybe that, that contributes to it. And then, and then sometimes I say jokingly, it's because we have to put up with Sunderland men. <laughs> that's very unfair <laughs> I love Sunderland man my, my life partner is fantastic so yeah and you mentioned I guess that your, your greatest day for Sunderland football was your, was your first day as a fan but it was also quite a traumatic time whilst you were at Sunderland yeah. too so how did that affect you in, in the role that you were doing so in my second season there at the end of the second season we were relegated and it was extremely difficult because it was clear from the January of that season we were going down and it was clear we'd have to really cut the cost base of the club. So we made something like 90 people redundant. Again, with that number, you have to give people three months notice and go through consultation. So so the club went through all of that. And it, when you're a member of staff working there, you know it is traumatic. I've never done anything and I've done other stressful kind of tasks, projects, cases, whatever you want to call them, both before and since. But I've never worked on anything which was so grindingly emotional for everybody involved. It was very, very difficult to see good friends and colleagues have to have to lose their jobs. And yes, it really left its mark, Sue. It was difficult. And I learned very quickly that this wonderful industry of football and, and sport that we all want to work with in and count ourselves as very lucky to work in it's not all stardust and sunshine it can be a really grim business it really can and every year as we know three clubs have to go down and if they haven't planned for it properly the effects can be devastating that's so true isn't it so true um how did you go on to get your ne your next role in the premier league yeah so I should say my story at Sunderland have a, had a happy ending because two seasons after that, which was actually my last season at the club, we got re-promoted, which was wonderful. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I left to, to join the Premier League and it was a very difficult decision. The, the opportunity to work for them came up and it was very, very difficult because I'd done that thing, which I think a lot of people from young people, certainly of our generation so who weren't originally from London you move to London you spend the first 10 years of your career there and then you think okay you know the dream is always to go home 
I will sell my house because we'd all, we were all able to buy houses in our 30s, weren't we, unlike the youngsters in London now. And, and with that, I will buy a wonderful mansion back in County Durham. That was always the dream, right? And I kind of done that. But the opportunity came up to work at the, the Premier League and it was super, super tough. And I thought, what do I do here? I've got my dream job, you know. I do have a lovely house on the coast and Sunderland has a beautiful coast with a sea view and all of this. What do I do? And to cut a very, very long story short, I I actually got some counsel from somebody who I worked with at the time who one day just, just caught me looking down. I have the worst poker face in the world. You can read me like a book. And he said to me, you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders. What on earth is going on? So I told him, I said, look, I've got this big decision to make. I've got an offer from the Premier League. I don't know what to do. And he just said straight away, he said, take it. He said, we'd hate to lose you, but it's the biggest, best league in the world. You've got to take that opportunity. It's a real opportunity. So, yeah, so that was May 2005. I, I joined the Premier League and I let, it was May and everybody thinks football goes to sleep at the end of the season. But no, this was, <laughs> <laughs> I finished work at Sunderland on the Monday. And actually it was a lovely day because we were all on the bus going around the town waving the championship trophy. I got the train to London on the Tuesday and on the Wednesday I started work at the Premier League because <laughs> they're right into the thick of planning for next season already at that point. And what was your role there? So I joined as head of football administration and it was a bit of a reversal of what I'd done at the clubs because I part of the role was to scrutinise all the player contracts and transfers when they came in, make sure they were all in order, everything we needed to register the player and the, the transfer were there, make sure the transfer fee had been received into the Premier League central clearinghouse account and only once everything was in order then register the the player. That was part of it. For for reasons I've never completely understood, I also did the fixtures. That was uh, (laughs) part of the job and I did it. And I have to say I loved it. Um, I worked very closely with the Football League because you have to schedule the fixtures for all the clubs at once. You can't just break up break it up league by league. Um, so that was part of the job for a, a few years. And I also, from the start, looked after the Premier League rule book. And the rules are legally binding on every Premier League club. And I think it's fair to say in 2005, the rule book was probably about a centimetre thick. If, if you look at it now, it's about three centimetres thick. And again, that's not because we liked creating rules for the the sake of creating rules, but just as business and the money flows grew, it it was just important to put in place more more regulation, but always hopefully fit for purpose and actually keeping it as light touch as possible because clubs are well placed to run their own business, you know. And in 2015, I think you moved on to UK sport. So why the move from, from football at that time? So it was another really difficult decision, but I had to be honest with myself after 10 years at the Premier League that I felt I needed a new challenge. I was getting a bit stale. And when you're a football lawyer, Sue, it doesn't get better than being director of governance at the Premier League. It really doesn't. But I still thought I, I'm not being stretched anymore. No disrespect to the Premier League. That's purely because I've been doing it for 10 years. For a decade, yeah, yeah. But again, you know, in in this space, sort of sport legal, sport regulatory, there aren't loads of jobs. It's another thing people who are younger lawyers and thinking of building a career in sport need to be mindful of. It's just if you're an employment lawyer, you you can change job. You know, you could be in a new job next month. It's easy because there's tens of thousands of employment lawyers in the UK. Sports law is very small. So it can take a while to find the next move. But I went because I... I thought there were real synergies. I liked the opportunity to work with the British Olympic and Paralympic programmes. I could see that there was a job to be done around governance. And I liked the idea of of kind of working in the public sector. Not my first spell, but I think, again, you know, one of the things I really like about my career is I've had spells in both public and private sectors and really enjoyed both. And it was obviously such an important time, as you've alluded to, for British sport in terms of the code for sport governance. Can you tell us a little bit about your role there and your work there? Yeah, so I I sort of looked at it and we were getting some questions from DCMS, you know, what can we do to improve sports governance? And I think one of the questions was actually, could we take the UK corporate governance code, which is the one that applies to public limited companies? So, you know, Barclays and 
Marks and Spencer, etc. Why don't we just take that and apply it to sport? And I said, well, you could take most of it or a lot of it, perhaps not most of it, but a lot of it. But where it doesn't work is that those big PLCs have very sophisticated investing shareholders who aren't emotionally invested. It's a monetary thing. So if they don't like how British Ball Bearings PLC is performing and how its governance is performing, they just take their money out and go and invest it in, you know, Scottish and Welsh Ball Bearings PLC instead. (laughs) Sport's not like that. If you are a passionate fan and player of British Tiddlywinks and you don't like the way the British Tiddlywinks Association is conducting itself, you can't just go, well, I think I'll take up judo now instead. It it doesn't work like that. But we said there may be ways that you can kind of backfill for that and and compensate for that. And actually, and this is something I felt quite strongly, was that the, the hundreds of millions of pounds of public money going into British sport, and that's your money, Sue, my money, the listeners, all their money, we shouldn't just be asking for sporting returns. We should absolutely ask for those, and that's primary and number one. But we should be asking those organisations to kind of be fit for purpose 21st century organisations. Hence the idea, why don't we create a code for sports governance? I spoke to uh, fabulous Moya Dodd on a previous series of the podcast, and she talked about the 40-40-20 governance goal in boards in Australia. Do you look back now and think that's something that UK sports should have aimed for with that first code for governance? I think I think there's a couple of things about targets looking back. I think I think the thirty percent was was kind of right for the time, but I'd prefer forty forty twenty now. I think that's a better encapsulation of it. The bit that the code didn't get right was on ethnic diversity. And again, it didn't say nothing and there was you know, you could say, well, had it been done this way, had it been done that way, just on the wording of the code, we shouldn't be where we are. But I I don't want to suggest that. I don't want to try and get into like a if only conversation. I think we've got to be honest, it didn't work to shift the dial enough on getting more black and Asian people onto the boards of British sports. So I'm very pleased it's being reviewed. Uh, We obviously saw some huge changes in governance in terms of sports national governing bodies from the code, which is fantastic. Do you ever think we'll see that level of gender balance on the boards of, of football clubs in the near future? Very good question. Very good question. I think, I mean, I think we're beginning to see it with the county FAs because they have their version of the governance code now. I should also, I'd like to name check Lindsay Tweddle at Sport England because the code was not just me, you know, it was a team, but Lindsay in particular was my absolute kind of key partner on it. She worked with the FA to introduce the the, the governance code that the county FAs will, will do. I think we've seen the FA's new voluntary code come out about leadership and I think with, again, racial equality, I think that absolutely will shift the dial. Gender, I think the dial was beginning to shift. Will it shift more? I think it will. It takes time on gender, I think. But my experience of talking to clubs is that they are, they're kind of where Bob Murray was, you know, my old chairman. You know, they, they just want the best talent. They don't care what it looks like. And they're happy to, big clubs, happy to, invest in the talent, develop people with a view to them getting those senior leadership positions and board positions. So I don't want to go into too much detail about Greg Clark's falling over his words in front of a select committee last week, but I wonder what are your hopes for the next appointment of a a new chair at the FA? So I think that the FA, I think they will do the job. I mean, again, they're a big professional organisation. I think they need to think really hard about what skills and experience and personal attributes that they need of uh, from their chair. I don't think it's as simple as saying it should be a woman or it should be a person of colour. That's the chair we need. Uh, I think that it's more about having the right person. My own chair at Brew Cox Alley uses this, this great phrase, who's really internalised the values that football stands for. So who's done the kind of hard work to really think about everything that people like us are saying, people like Kick It Out are saying, and truly understand the experiences of our members, of, of Black and Asian people, and internalise that so that they kind of live it and breathe it. 
So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a different profile of chair of, of the FA, but, but I don't think it's as simple as protected characteristic and it needs to be someone with that protected characteristic. I, one of my absolutely super radical thoughts, which I don't know if anyone will take me up on, is it'd be great to see co-chairs because I think it's a massive job and I think it involves different skills. You have to be the public face and you have to be able to inspire the nation to an extent or the footballing nation. You've got a, a management role in there. You, you're the line manager of the, the CEO. You've got to lead the board and you've got to go and do the kind of football politics bit around the tables in Switzerland at UA from FIFA. It's a big ask. And I think co-chairing could just help kind of diffuse the pressure on one person. It actually enables more skills to be brought to it. But But I'm a massive advocate for job shares anyway, Sue. Yeah, I really am. I, I worked with a couple of colleagues at UK Sport who shared a role on a job share basis and it was brilliant. I thought every job should be like this. <laughs> you know, it just works brilliantly. So, but anyway, that's my thoughts on the FA. Excellent, excellent. I'd like to move you on if I can uh, to talk a little bit more about women in football. So I guess firstly, roughly, if you can tell me, how many women do you think are working in, in football in Britain in 2020? Okay, so I have to do a bit of a finger in the air and go through some mental arithmetic here. So stand by, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody really knows. I think clubs will know, big big organisations will know because they'll have their own data. But I work it out like this. Um, so a couple of years ago, the Premier League published an impact study that Ernst & Young had worked on with them. And, and it was about the economic impact of the Premier League in this country. Lots of data in there not just about football workforce, but there are a couple of key stats about the football workforce. And the Premier League said that it and its member clubs directly employed 13,500 full-time equivalent posts. And not only that, but the Premier League directly and indirectly supported 100,000 jobs in the UK. And when you take into account the fact that the Premier League made huge contributions to the youth development operations of VFL clubs, to all the club community organisations and trusts and foundations. You can see how it does begin to get up to, into the tens of thousands and pushing 100,000. So how many of those women? Well, here we have to come to the finger in the air in our own experience. But my experience based on going on for 20 years working in football is it's somewhere between 25 and 40%. Let's say it's 25%, but immediately you can see that if you apply the 25 to either the 13,500 or the 100,000, it's massive. And in fact, the first time I went through this piece of mental arithmetic, I kind of went, wow. wow. So actually, <laughs> English football couldn't exist without its female workforce, and it couldn't. And I think those numbers might have shifted now because we've started to see more people working in women's football although again COVID will have an impact and we, we need to, to wait and see what that is and and we know from talking to our membership there isn't a job in football but there's a woman doing it N- name your job in football and I can name your woman who's doing it and and the chances are she's she's a, a woman in football member the challenge Sue as you know is that we don't yet have enough women in leadership positions and that female workforce can be concentrated. You know, the, the workforce is kind of gender segmented. In fairness, just as it is in the rest of the UK economy, you know, and it's changing and we can see that. But what we're about is to really speed up that rate of change. And we see that we in some of the really fantastic women working in women's football at the FA, but not always the similar posts across, you know, on the male side of the game. Are you seeing that change, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, I go back to my time at the Premier League and the wonderful, incredible women working there. And this was before the WSL had been set up and all the big clubs had uh, women's teams, um, ditto in clubs uh, and ditto at the FA. So I think, you you know, my experience is there have always been women working in marketing, comms, legal, finance, HR, pitch side roles in the men's game. Yeah, there's a few. And, and it's increasing, but again, not enough, not enough. And who are your members? Who are the members of women in football and what kind of roles do they have? They do everything, basically, everything. Name a, a role in football, the, there's a woman doing it and there are women in football members doing it. 
I want to say loud and clear, we absolutely welcome men being me- members. Um, we love I was going to ask you about yeah, that next. We love, our, we love them. We love our male allies. They play such an important role in this. And we know, I know, that you know, so many men are 100% behind what we do and, and are working hard to, to help us with it. And why did you take the role as the organisation's first CEO? Because when Ebru Coxall asks you to do something, you can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> She'll kill oh, me for that. That's a bit true. I love Ed Bruce. She's absolutely brilliant. But I I saw it. I see an odd one, Sue. This is a real odd one. I'd looked, you know, working at the Premier League, I'd, I'd seen what the CEO did there and working at UK Sport, I saw what the CEO did there. And I thought, my God, I never want to be a CEO of anything. You know, what's wrong? Oh, poof, bloody hell. So. <laughs> Here I am. Now, listen, women in football is not UK sport or, or the Premier League. We are a small but but I'm delighted to say growing organisation. But when um, when the opportunity came up, I thought, wow, what an opportunity. What an opportunity to really take this movement, which is what it is, it's what we are, and which is as relevant and vital as ever and really drive it forward and make a difference. So, so those were the reasons why I took it. And what are your ambitions for for the future, 10 years or five years, as it were? Well, we always say, laughingly, that, that we, we're, we're working towards our own redundancy. You know, we shouldn't need to exist, and, and we will welcome the day when we don't need to exist. Our vision is football as a sport and as an industry, which is truly gender diverse and where everybody can flourish and and reach their full potential no matter what they look like and what part we mentioned earlier Barclays what part have Barclays played recently in that kind of development and evolution of women in football so Barclays has been a fantastic partner for of women in football for many years and um last year we kind of renewed and refreshed and uplifted our partnership they work with us brilliantly. I love working with them. You know, Sue, so with my background as a lawyer, I'd never worked in the marketing space. And I didn't really understand how the partnership works between the, the sponsor and the sponsee, as we lawyers call them. You know? um, and I completely get it now. And it's, it's about much more than just money passing. It's about working together to deliver shared goals. Uh, it's about, you know, they have input and on, on our plans and projects and I regard them as absolutely wise counsel, trusted people. I always want their view on something because I know it'll be good. I know it'll be useful. And of course, because Barclays have partnerships across football, not only helps them that we kind of add to that, but it helps us hugely as well. It's not the ideal sponsor, not there. I have found they, they have been fantastic to work with. I think there is yeah. a, yeah. Set apart from others, I think. Yeah. Um, you recently undertook, undertook some membership research with the lovely team at Sports Marketing Survey. So what were the major findings there? And did any of that really surprise you in terms of uh, discovery? Yes, yeah, so we've done a couple of surveys with them. We did a, a, a huge member survey last March, probably just before the impact of COVID had, had hit. Um, we've done a series of pulse surveys through COVID. And if I try and pull it all together, what this is telling us, the first thing it tells us is that when we ask members, what's your experience is now? Where do you think the game's at now? What's it feel like for you right now? There was bad news and good news. So the bad news was that 66% of our members had experienced discrimination at some point in their career. And they'd felt that their, you know, a, a large number of them had felt their career had been blocked, that yes, their gender had been an issue. But then coming through, and this was very different from when we asked the same questions maybe four or five years ago, there was a sense of optimism. And a lot of them said, I do feel supported by my employer. I do feel as a woman looking forward, it is possible to build a, a career in the game. So I think felt that we were looking at an industry on the cusp of change. There's a kind of old football, a bad football that we all recognise, but there's this new football coming and it's getting ever, ever closer. And then, of course, COVID hit and the number one thing they told us was how tough they were finding it. And, And again, we know football is not alone in this. We know women aren't alone in this, but the impact on their mental health suit was staggering, what what they were telling us. And we've been trying super hard to to help with that 
you know, we've run online mindfulness sessions. We're, we're going to be doing some more sessions around uh, building up your own resilience and tools to help you if if your mental health is, is taking a hit. We connected them up with each other because, again, just, you know, just open up a Zoom link. It's not us talking to them. It's them talking to each other. Go, just talk to each other. And those have been some incredibly powerful conversations. So, again, we know that a lot of them are, are hurting big through this. We, we know that the burdens of childcare and working seem on the whole to have fallen harder on women than they have on men through through the first lockdown. We've really encouraged football and all employers really to, to have a think about that and do some easy wins. You know, say to people, to everyone, to all your staff, I want to see where you are planning your time with your kids right now. And if you need to take two hours in the day, that's something I actually expect to see. You don't need to apologise for it. It's actually expected. Go and do it just to really, you know, help and help people manage through through this. It does sound like you're doing a, a fantastic job, clearly, and, and ever more important, really. Um, you've just been appointed to a new board role. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm really delighted to be appointed as chair of the Professional Game Academy Audit Company. Now, this is a sort of joint venture. It's jointly owned by the FA, the Premier League and the EFL. And its purpose is to support the academies and the youth development programmes in the male professional game. And it does that in a variety of ways, one of which is to um, carry out audits of the academies, um, assess the outputs of that and make recommendations about academy status through to uh, the the decision making body, which which sits in the FA. So for me, Sue, it's a it's a a return to those days of drafting the youth development rules, because that's actually the backbone of, of what's being audited. So, so that was my routine. You know, I did know something about this world. I'm delighted. And again, on a personal level, while I absolutely love the women in football world and everything that that has to offer, it's nice to have a foot back in male professional football and a little bit of what I did earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was fascinated to see that you've been gathering some more qualifications in sort of the creative writing <laughs> yeah. space. I want to talk to you about that away from here. I was very inspired. <laughs> So what's the, your kind of passion or your driver there? That's really interesting. Well, you know, you have to go back to what I told you about my childhood. My mum took me to the RSC and my dad took me to Sunderland Football Club. It's, and honestly, these are twin passions and they have driven me all my life. I'm not sure if I've been in pursuit of them or they've been pursuing me. But the, these are absolutely the two drivers of my kind of professional or mental life, if you like. But again, there's a connection because after I drafted the youth development rules, a lawyer Another lawyer in football he didn't work at the Premier League. He worked in private practice. About six months after they'd been published, I was I had a meeting with him about something. At the end of the meeting, he said to me, he said, by the way, Jane, your youth development rules, he said, they were beautifully drafted. Now, Sue, lawyers never compliment each other, right? <laughs> we, we just don't do it. It's like, no. <laughs> so I was like, oh, <laughs> OK, that's interesting. And it made me think. I thought, I think maybe I have got a bit of a way with words. I don't get it right all the time, but maybe I can use language quite well. That goes back to the English degree, right? And I thought I would love to give some creative writing a go. And so I did some online courses with the University of York, very casual. They weren't credit bearing or anything like that, but I loved them. And from there on, I kept doing more and more and more. And I've now just started the third year of a Master of Fine Arts with Manchester Metropolitan University. I've, oh God, I've got to write a novel this year, Sue. <laughs> yeah. we talk, we'll have to catch up over, off of here, won't we? <laughs> don't ask me what it's about because I don't know yet, but we'll figure it out, you know. <laughs> we'll figure that one out. <laughs> Fantastic. And just finally, in, in closing, if you were to give, I guess, nuggets of advice, career advice to women, I know that you must do this a lot in your role, but young women coming through the sports sector today, what, what would that be? Well, I reiterate a couple of things I said earlier. Have a, have a good best friend who knows you better than you know yourself. Always, 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 always apply for the job you don't think you're going to get. That's number one. That was my Sunderland story. Apply for it. I think for women, you know, if you've got imposter syndrome, it's worth spending some time working on that and work with a, a good coach or mentor or come talk to us at, at Women in Football 
just to, to work through and get rid because your imposter doesn't serve you. Your imposter doesn't tell you the truth and isn't helpful. So it's worth spending some time to, to unpick all of that and get a fairer view of who you are. Set your dreams and go for them and absolutely go for them. I'm afraid a career in sport is hard, hard work. I can see you nodding furiously at that. <laughs> and, and, it is, and there's no excuse. Uh, oh, sorry, not no excuse. There's no alternative. That's the only way to, to get ahead. So be prepared for that. Keep learning, keep developing. Again, I think the way careers are now, that's vital for all of us, Sue, right? You know, ladies of our age, we have to keep going and learning and doing stuff. So work hard, keep freshening your skills up and remember that if you have imposter syndrome, it's lying to you and it's not helping you. So think hard about how much attention to give it. I love talking to Jane. Aside from the fact that we have so much in common, it's wonderful to hear about all that women in football are delivering for those working in the sector. Thanks again to Barclays for supporting this series of The Game Changers and also to Sam Walker, who is the rather wonderful executive producer of this podcast. You can find out more about all of my guests from this and previous series at fearlesswomen.co.uk. And if, like me, you're a big fan of Strictly, why not listen to the stories of the guests who have appeared on the show in the past, including Denise Lewis, Lauren Steadman, Gabby Logan and Judy Murray. If you're enjoying The Game Changers, do tell your friends, family and colleagues about the podcast. And you can find us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at Sue Anstis or at The Game Changers. Next week, I'm talking to the one and only Jill Scott. It's a wonderful and very funny conversation with a lioness who has 149 caps for England and is now player coach at Man City. Even now, like, it's hard to look back and think about all the World Cups you've been to, Olympics, European Championships, because I still just feel like that girl that goes training and gives it everything. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport.